Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. In this video, we're going to be discussing the coronavirus of 2019, more specifically COVID-19. And we'll see once this virus gets inside particular cells of the host, how it dumps its RNA into the host cell cytoplasm, and then what that RNA does to assist in the replication cycle of the virus. So first of all, a little bit of background information about coronaviruses. This is a class of viruses, not one in particular, and they are large enveloped RNA viruses that cause severe acute respiratory syndrome, or SARS. And they have a large RNA genome. I mentioned down here that their genome size is about 30,000 nucleotides. And these are RNA viruses. And so the actual capsid right here of the virus is going to contain that RNA and whenever the virus gets inside the host cell the RNA enters the host cell cytoplasm and we're going to see a bunch of different processes occur on that RNA. Now when we look at the coronavirus as it replicates inside a host cell it's going to have two fairly unique biochemical mechanisms. One is going to be ribosome frame shifting during genome translation. We're going to see that in the initial production of polyproteins, which are actually used to generate most of the protein machinery of the replosome slash transcriptosome. Okay? And we're also going to see synthesis of both genomic and multiple subgenomic RNA species. And we'll talk about what that means in a few minutes on one of the next slides. And so a hallmark of the coronavirus transcription process is we're going to see many subgenomic mRNAs. So these are different sized mRNAs that are created from the original RNA genome. Again, we'll look at that in more detail on one of the next slides. So here's a diagram illustrating how coronaviruses enter cells and then all the biochemical reactions that take place once inside the host cell. So notice in this particular host cell plasma membrane, we have this protein receptor called CEACAM1. This protein is actually going to be influential in bringing the virus particle into the host cell. If we look at this virus, it has these peripheral proteins around it. These are called spike proteins. And it turns out that CEACAM1 binds to these spike proteins, as you can see right here. And once bound, this protein, through conformational changes and alterations in the plasma membrane, will facilitate a sort of receptor-mediated endocytosis that pulls the virus inside the host cell. Once inside, we have uncoding, so all of these proteins will be removed, and the contents of the virus itself, which is really just this genomic RNA, will be released into the host cell cytoplasm. Now this genomic RNA is what we call RNA positive, and I'll typically write that as RNA with this plus sign right here. That just means it's the sense strand of the RNA. But this is the genome of the coronavirus, and as I mentioned on the previous slide, it's approximately 30,000 nucleotides long. And then the host cell machinery, that is the ribosomes and so on and so forth, are going to translate this RNA strand. And they're going to translate it in a couple of open reading frames. We're actually going to look at that on the next couple of slides. So first of all, we have the coronavirus RNA sense strand. This is the genomic RNA. And we're going to get translation via the host cell machinery. And ultimately what we're going to get are two polyproteins. These are very large proteins that come from this RNA. And those are polyprotein 1A and polyprotein 1AB. Now, as I mentioned on the very first slide here, something interesting in coronavirus replication is that during this translation to get these polyproteins, we're going to see some frame shifting. And so the way that we get these two polyproteins right here is via frame shifting during translation. Okay. So you can see here we have an open reading frame 1A, and then we have over here open reading frame 1B. And this section between this point right here and this point, this is what's going to give us these polyproteins. And sometimes they're referred to as replicase polyproteins because the proteins that come from these polyproteins are going to be involved in replication and further transcription. Okay. And so what this allows is as translation is occurring, okay, we can clearly get through this open reading frame 1A, which will give us polyprotein 1A. And that's what I actually showed you right here, polyprotein 1A. However, something else that can happen is as translation is occurring, 
when we get to this point right here, we can actually have a frame shift to a different open reading frame in the middle of the translation. And so we can move from open reading frame 1A to that of 1B. And so we can get a protein that's a hybrid of two open reading frames, which just in essence gives us a different polyprotein termed 1AB. And in any case, these proteins are going to be proteolized into a bunch of smaller proteins. And collectively, these proteins in general are involved in replication, so a replicase complex, and transcription, so the transcriptase complex. And so what these proteins will do is they'll combine with that genomic RNA, the sense strand, like this, and they'll facilitate replication. Now, when this coronavirus genomic RNA plus is replicated, it gives us a genomic RNA, but that happens to be anti-sense strand. So it's RNA minus. And it turns out that there's a couple of things that the cell will actually do with this anti-sense RNA. So here's our anti-sense RNA right here. Two things can happen with this. One, it can be replicated back into sense RNA, which is essentially the same thing that came in with the original virus during uncoding. Or this anti-sense RNA can be transcribed. And it's transcribed in a method called discontinuous transcription, which we'll talk about in a few minutes in more detail. But notice that from this one anti-sense RNA, we can actually transcribe a bunch of different RNAs right here. These are essentially mRNAs that can then be translated into different proteins. So from this one RNA right here, this one antisense RNA, we can get all of these different mRNAs down here and therefore all of these different proteins. So those two processes are going to take place. Let's actually look at this schematic right here. Here's our antisense RNA, RNA minus. So the first thing that can happen to this antisense RNA is it can simply be replicated to get back the original genomic RNA or the RNA sense strand. Okay? And this is actually the strand that will be repackaged into the viral offspring, those virions that will then, then be released to infect other cells. Okay? The other thing that can happen with this antisense RNA or RNA minus is it can undergo something called discontinuous transcription. And the gist of this in simplistic terms is that from this one antisense RNA strand, the RNA dependent RNA polymerase, which is the enzyme that transcribes this, can bind and initiate transcription at different points. And so the net result is you get a bunch of mRNAs of different lengths, and therefore they encode different proteins. And these are what we call subgenomic mRNAs because they all come from the same antisense strand of RNA, so they're subgenomic. But each of these is going to encode a different protein. And these are going to be viral proteins that will eventually be packaged again into the viral offspring or the virions, which can then be released to infect further cells. Another look here at the discontinuous transcription that we're going to see. So here is our mRNA right here. Here's our mRNA. And what you see here is there is a leader TRS. TRS stands for Transcription Regulatory Sequences. Okay? And we have this long sequence right here of mRNA that actually encodes the replicase polyprotein region. Okay? Then we have these other body TRSs or body transcription regulatory sequences. One right here. Another one here, 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 and here. So let's suppose we wanted to get this one right here, mRNA number 7, which would eventually encode structural protein number 7. Well, we would start transcribing this mRNA from this point right here. We'd be moving to the left. And as soon as we get to this body TRS right here that corresponds to number 7, the transcription actually jumps all the way over here to the leader TRS and finishes transcription to the left. Okay? That means that everything between this body TRS and this leader TRS is completely omitted. The transcription jumps from this point all the way over here. That's why it is discontinuous transcription. There's actually a jump there. Another example would be, let's say, this mRNA number 5. That corresponds to this particular TRS right here. So again, transcription would begin over here on the far right, 
it moves to the left, and as soon as it gets to this body TRS, the transcription jumps discontinuously over to the leader TRS and completes transcription going to the left. So every one of these mRNAs right here that encode these structural proteins, all of them are going to contain this sequence over here on the far left, but they're all going to have a certain amount emitted from the middle, and then they'll all have some amount of it from the right, at least the part complementary to that. And so the net result here is that you get different mRNAs of different lengths that all encode different proteins. And so that's what we see right here. We have different subgenomic mRNAs that are made via discontinuous transcription. These mRNAs are then translated into viral proteins. And again, those viral proteins are combined with the original genomic sense RNA to make the progeny. So now to step back and take a look at how we actually make the viral progeny, right here we have all those viral proteins that we just made. Okay? Again, they're made via translation from these subgenomic mRNAs. Okay? Now that translation specifically occurs in the rough ER because this is going to involve the secretory pathway. Remember the secretory pathway from cell biology is going to involve the rough ER, Golgi apparatus, and eventual exocytosis. That's how the progeny actually get out. Okay? So this translation that we just mentioned occurs in the rough ER. So once these proteins are made via the rough ER, they're sent with this RNA, that sense RNA, ultimately to the Golgi apparatus, where they're put inside of vesicles and packaged as the viral progeny. And then, just like any vesicle would, it would be exocytose, and that releases the viral progeny, now a full mature coronavirus, to go infect other cells. Okay? And so ultimately, that is the life cycle of coronavirus inside cells. So you can see here that it involves a bunch of fairly unique uh, genetic and biochemical mechanisms, and hopefully it gave you a good understanding of how this virus functions. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.